Hello. Hello. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for uh, this opportunity for our students and us. So Thank I think you, uh, we we can. Yes. Yes. So uh, we can begin the meeting in just one minute. I will share the uh, this thing meeting ID with uh, my consultants also. Sure. Sure. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Just give me a minute. We'll start. Sure. Yes, uh, let's uh, start the session. Okay. So good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Kruti Modi Doshi, and uh, I'm an oculoplasty surgeon. Today, what we are discussing is lacrimal drainage system. Okay, so essentially how you will go about when a patient comes to you and what you will plan. That is the main purpose of our uh, this presentation. So can I go ahead? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. We are listening. Yes. Yeah. So one moment. Ah, one second, one second. No, I have this is the right click and then slide. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So just a little brief on the anatomy, not going too much in detail, but the essential things that we have to be careful about. All of us know the system begins with the puncta. The thing to remember is the upper puncta is more medial than the lower puncta. Okay. Then next comes the canalicular system, which has a vertical and a horizontal part. The vertical part is about two millimeters and the horizontal part is about eight millimeters on an average. We will come to details why I'm pointing out these things, okay? We all know then we come to a common canaliculus, the lacrimal sac and opens in the nasolacrimal duct. Now in the second image, which is there, you can see that the nasolacrimal duct opens below the inferior turbinate, okay? This location is important. Also, where the sac lies in the nose, that orientation is also important, okay? This is the endoscopic view. So, uh, the central MT, what is written, that's the middle turbinate. The shaded portion where I've written L, that is the uh, space where the lacrimal sac is located, okay? Um, on the right side is the septum, left side is your lateral part of the nasal cavity, okay? So now what are the sites of obstruction? The most commonest site that all of us know is the nasolacrimal duct obstruction, okay? The next common site is a common canalicular obstruction. We can also have obstructions at the puncta, also at the canalicular system. Now, when a patient comes to you, how is the patient going to come? <clears throat> Commonest way of watering. Lot of watering, not stopping, I'm not crying, I keep watering. Okay. The next is discharge. Now, discharge is not something you always get. Discharge you get with nasolacrimal duct obstruction, yes. But if your obstruction is more proximal than the common canaliculus, if it is a common canalicular, canalicular or punctal obstruction, you will not get discharged because it is your lacrimal sac which has the goblet cells which forms the discharge, okay? The other presentation is a swelling in the lacrimal sac area, okay? There is a swelling, I press on the swelling and the swelling goes away. That is what the patient says, okay? This is a mucosy. So all this is a presentation of a chronic dacryocystitis. The other presentation is a patient coming like this. Periocular swelling, redness, pain. 
swelling has appeared overnight, has just appeared. There's no other history. You try to get history of any insect bite or fever or nothing like that. It is essentially, but the maximum, the pain, the tenderness is there over the lacrimal sac area. The swelling is there over the lacrimal sac area. The patient does give history of watering discharge before this. Okay. If you have a patient coming with acute dacryocystitis, you manage this acute episode with antibiotics, anti-inflammatories. You do not jump into surgical match. Chronic dacryocystitis, you can, but not with acute. Okay. There are indications with acute can also be managed. We will discuss that later. Okay, so these are the common presentation. So when the patient comes to you, Roplas test, regurgitation on pressure over the lacrimal sac area. Essentially, the lacrimal sac area from externally, you give pressure and you see either clear fluid or discharge regurgitating from the puncta. If it is Roplas positive, you can say that there is a nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Essentially, the fluid is not draining out from the nose and that is why it is regurgitated. Okay, very simple test, especially if you have children, congenital, I am not covering congenital in this, but just in children with congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction, Roplas positive is the simplest test to do and you know what you are dealing with. A short video of syringe. The thing that I want to point out, enter through the puncta, rotate it. Once you are through the vertical part, rotate it, make your canaliculus horizontal, let it go beyond the common canalicular area. And Don't up. just push when you have barely entered the vertical part. Go deep, go beyond the common canaliculus, and then you push fluid. It will see what happens you take, if you take a small needle. Sometimes a lot of places we take a small needle, we remove the sharp end and we use it as a blunt tip. You don't go deep enough, okay? If there's common canalicular stenosis, it's not a complete obstruction, you will still get a regurgitation, okay? And you will not know where it is coming from. The other advantage of using a canalicular uh, is that you know how deep you are going. So at the same time, you are being able to evaluate the site of obstruction. If I'm not going to, go, I'm not being able to go beyond two millimeters, I'm going till four millimeters, or am I actually crossing the common canaliculus? So at the same time, you are evalu evaluating your canalicular system as well, and you are checking for your NLD, okay? <clears throat> um, nasal cavity evaluation is important. This is a quick uh, video to just see. I'll just go ahead, yeah. So essentially what you want to see is the septum. Is there any deviated nasal septum? And any other anatomical uh, difference. Because when you're going to operate a lot of times when there's a deviated nasal septum, you don't have adequate place. Okay, when you make the flap and all. And that space restriction invariably with all the uh, surgical tissue, it does cause uh, septa fibrosis in that area and post-op patient is not very comfortable. So if there is a deviated nasal septum, address that in the same sitting or in different sitting or whatever you want, however it works for you, okay? So essentially, how do you go about? Now, uh, and, uh, yes, yes. Uh, you said uh, you have to go beyond the common canal. Yes, yes. But if uh, there is any common canal block, uh, isn't it you can't to... go beyond it. So you know there's an obstruction over there. Yeah, so okay. So there might be the soft soft okay. might, yes. might be there. So but, then uh, there might be chances. Yeah. Of, so uh, when you have a soft stop, you go from the upper upper punctum and then you try. Okay. If it's a common canalicular, you'll get a soft stop from upper and lower. Okay. Then you push very gently. Don't do a forceful pushing to just see whether it is coming down. See. If you are in the canalicular system, if you are pushing and there is no space for the fluid to go, no, it becomes painful for the patient. Okay. So when you have an idea that there's an obstruction over here, this is what I'm dealing with. Let, but still push and see if it's a partial, if it's just a stenosis. 
is their fluid going at all or no? Okay. And then for these common canalicula, you use a probe as well. Okay. Uske baad probing kar lo. You always keep a probe in the OPD and always probe uh, even if like if you have any kind of obstruction before your sac area, always probe and ascertain at what level you are getting your obstruction. Okay. Did I answer your question? Uh, what I want to ask yes. is that if uh, you are asking us to go beyond the canal floor, inadvertently sometimes there might be a probe, uh, you are going to make one opening. Uh, first passage, no forceful movements. Go along the path. If you are not doing forceful movements, no false passages will be formed. Hmm? No forcing. If your canaliculus is not going, come out, use the probe. See where you are reaching. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Madam, one question, like yes. for the students, uh, yes. at what distance you expect the common canalicular block and what distance you expect only the canalicular block to be present yes. when you are doing uh, probing later? Right. So, uh, the, as we know, the canalicular system... I the the t-shirt, newspaper The vertical plane is the tip of the tip. And the horizontal part on an average is eight millimeters. So on an average from the punctum, a common canaliculus is at 10 millimeters. Okay. So when you repeatedly do it, even if you don't measure exactly, you get an idea of approximately kidhar tak you have reached. And once you pass the common canaliculus, you get that feeling a little giveaway. So you know you are beyond. So that's that. Okay. Answer? So so anything less than say 10 millimeter will be a canalicular block rather than only common is that right yes that is right on an average okay. that 10 on an average okay. okay yes okay. yes yes and if it's the common canal block, yes. you, you will get a clear regurgitation. You will get a soft stop. Soft stop? With a clear regurgitation. See, now you have to put everything together. You put your history and your findings together. Okay. When there is discharge, you know there's an NLD block That's a, in some form. Okay. Now you have a common canalicular block on your probing, syringing probing. So now you know you have a NLD plus a common canalicular. That is possible. Okay, you need not have only, it's not necessary that the block has to be at only one place. So now you know you're dealing with a combination. The other thing where you can get stuck is you have a complete common canalicular block or a canalicular block. You don't know the status of your NLD. If the patient is not giving history of discharge, and if the patient is uh, no mucosal formation, okay, it's just plain clear watering, then with only this, you cannot know your status of the NLD. Then that's a different uh, scenario to handle, which I think we are not going right now in detail, okay? So, uh, okay, now the next common thing which usually happens is, Patient wants to plan a cataract surgery. Can we operate or not? This is the commonest way the patient comes to Madam, cataract surgery karna kar le kya? Right? Because usually pre-op patient is evaluated and then there's some... So where you can operate and where you can't operate. Okay? Complete NLD is 100% no. Okay? Partial NLD. Less than 50%. Now, what do I mean by less than 50% and how do you know? When you are doing your syringing, the patient is getting some fluid in the throat and you are getting some regurgitation. When you are pushing, you know how much you are pushing. You have to evaluate how much is coming back. It's an approximate evaluation. It's not a 100%. But on an average, if you think that the regurg is not much. It is from what I'm pushing, maybe it's just 20, 30%. That means a considerable amount is flowing through. 
that is where I will call it a partial NLD. Theoretically, less than 50% can go ahead with cataract surgery, but practically I will say that if you think the regurg is very less, 20-30%, then be okay. Otherwise, you evaluate the parameters. Patients complain what is happening, other things. Okay. Mucosine. Mu now, mucosine, or we are coming to mucosine in detail also. Uh, mucosine or uh, NLD obstruction with a common canalicular block. You cannot pose for cataract surgery. Canalicular obstruction. Only canalicular obstruction, yes. Only punctal stenosis, yes. Failed DCR, you can't operate. Now, what's the entire concept of this? Okay. Now you have the sac. Sac is what has the goblet cells. Sac is where your discharge is being formed. That is the area which is the source of infection. Okay. This infection happens when you have an NLD obstruction. There's a retention of fluid in the sac and it causes infection. If that passage is clear, if your NLD is clear and your obstruction is before that, then you are you do not have the risk of infection. Okay, so that is the basis. So whether it, your sac is involved or not. Okay. Um, just going through the anatomically the obstructions that we get and how we manage the essential idea. You, if you have a punctal stenosis, I have seen very commonly in my practice. I don't know how it is in the other places. But this is the easiest thing to tackle, okay? There is a three snip punct. Uh, of course, there's grading of punctal stenosis. I'm sorry, not going into that also right now. But just to know what can be done, um, the procedure is a three snip, snip punctoplasty. You first see uh, the lower lid, your puncta you are seeing. My scissors are vertically. That's the first snip. It is going in the direction of your vertical canaliculus. Your vertical canaliculus is two millimeters. So your snip is not, not exceeding two millimeters for sure. Approximately two millimeters is your length of your first snip. Your second snip is perpendicular. So in the direction of your horizontal. You once you push your blade of the scissors, no, you will find the direction how the canaliculus is going. So that is your second snip. And the third is just connecting the two. So essentially, you are just making it a wide opening. This is going to stenose a little because of your body fibrosis, but they do well. If you have a punctal stenosis, you don't know the situation ahead, do a three snip. Call post-op. Evaluate your lacrimal system later, and then you will know what where is the further obstruction. Canalicular block. Now, management of canalicular block is... Um, it's a topic of discussion. Not all surgeons are very favorable towards it. The point is, okay, so now canalicular block, you have either a proximal, a mid, or a distal, okay? Proximal blocks. Now, how are you evaluating a canalicular block? You are passing your probe and you are seeing how far. Now, if I have a proximal block, I will not know how long is the block. I don't know if it is just proximal or is it extending all the way, okay? Touching a proximal block is, see, uh, managing a canalicular block is essentially a blind procedure, the canalicular tree finding what we do. That, if you have a proximal block, I would personally not really want to... Uh, do it because it's a blind procedure. I will not be able to follow the entire course of the system. Somewhere we will form a false passage. Okay. Proximal block, I would uh, tell the patient it is going to give you watering. If possible, live with it. If the patient is very keen, no kuch karna ye ho, I will think of options but I will not try to open up a proximal canalicular block, okay? Mid-canalicular block depends, it's 
protect. Usually it is the distal canalicular block which you do plan a tree fining. Okay. Now what a canalicular tree fine is, this is what it looks like. You have the upper stellate is the sharp instrument which goes inside the outer system which is the blunt instrument. You start from the punctum, you go along the canaliculus. When you reach the block, you push the outer stellate. I don't have a video, I'm sorry. And when you push the outer stellate, it punches at the site of obstruction. So if it's a small obstruction, you push it, it will just punch that part. Then you withdraw your stillet, slight aspiration to bring out what you have punched, flush with saline, then bring out your system and always intubate. When you have punched, it is going, the body is going to want to heal it. It will close it again, always intubate. So here you can use the mini monoka intubation, which is which we use in canalicular tear repair. Okay, so that is what can be used. Um, if you are uh, managing, you, if you're doing canalicular tree fine, always give a guarded prognosis to the patient, to your counsel. Not all do very well. Uh, many of them have a tendency of uh, stenosing again. So patient selection is very important. A patient who is very keen, you know, I want something to be done. Kuch to karo, madam. Those are the patients you select. Be very uh, selective about the patients you are planning the procedure. Okay, so uh, now if you have an isolated common, okay, you will not always know if it is isolated. But if you have an absolute common canalicular block, you are not being able to check what is further. The uh, patient's complaints are clear what real discharge. External DCR with intubation. Yes, it is a big procedure which you are doing for common canalicular block, but that is the best way to approach the common canaliculus. External. Your endonasal will not work as much because endonasally approaching the common canaliculus is a little difficult. Okay. Um, even if you will approach the common canaliculus, but in external, what we do is we actually we put a probe, you actually see where it's opening, where there is the block fibrosis, and you snip, you cut the fibrosis, which is there. That Excision cannot be done through endonasal. So preferred is external with intubation for a common canalicular block. Intubation, very important for canalicular blocks, common canalicular blocks. Please don't forget. Okay, now when we have a complete nasolacrimal duct obstruction, common, common scenario, DCR versus DCD. DCR is the preferred modality of management. When do you do a DCT? Okay, indications for DCT. Lacrimal sac tumor suspected. Patient has come with complaints of there is blood stained discharge. This is a commonest complaint when you will think of a lacrimal, possible lacrimal sac tumor or a lit, like lacrimal lit. Okay, old patient who is not medically fit for your DCR surgery. Severe dry eye where you want to give the uh, watering when you don't want, you want the uh, your tear fluid to remain in your cul-de-sac. And traumatic dacryocystitis, um, obstruction caused due to trauma. That again, you have to evaluate associated fractures, site of fracture. Then you decide uh, what can be done. Okay, is a DCR possible, not possible? But usually when it is traumatic, it is associated with a fracture of the bones around and their DCR becomes difficult. So it, yes, of course, depends on the location of the fracture, but uh, those are the times you will consider a DCT more of. Okay. Now external versus endonasal DCR. There are a lot of publications comparing the outcomes. At one point of time, it was said that uh, external uh, DCR outcomes are better than endonasal. But in, at today's uh, point of time, both the outcomes are equally good. 
if I'm talking only of the outcome of the DCR surgery. In addition, yes, endonasal has a few advantages. Revisions, uh, of course, the obvious advantage is there's no scar and there is lack of damage to pump mechanism. What do you mean? Your pump mechanism, your sac has orbicularis oculi over it. And the squeezing of this orbicularis oculi is what is happening, which is helping your uh, tears to flow down, the direction, downward flow of your tears. When you're doing external, you are incising your orbicularis. You are damaging the pump mechanism to some extent, more or less. Endonasally, you are not touching your orbicularis oculi. So that there's no damage to the pump mechanism. DCR revisions, of course, you can do externally also, you can do endo uh, nasally also. Uh, that is a personal thing. People say it is easier endonasally, but not necessary. That is uh, external also gives you good results for revisions. Acute lacrimal sac abscess. Now, when we were talking about presentation, a patient presenting with an abscess, you have two options. One, you take a small nick, you let a little bit of uh, your uh, purulent discharge flow out, the abscess which is formed. And then at a later date, you plan an external DCR. If you are doing an endonasal DCR, you can do in the setting of an acute uh, infection. Okay. Children who are coming with you, newborn kids, with either an abscess or a seal. That is when and you can go endonasally, but endonasally for children, again, you need the uh, pediatric setup, etc. But you can go. NLDO in patients re uh, receiving chemotherapy radiation. You prefer endonasal for these patients. Now, if you have a partial NLD obstruction, um, the modality if is a balloon catheter dilatation. Now, if your partial is more than 50-60%, please go and do a full-fledged DCR. Okay. Balloon catheter dilatation is for lesser obstructions, but the patient is still symptomatic. So in this, what is done is, uh, if you can see the thin, uh, the tube which is below the uh, the manometer, that is what actually goes through your punctum, through your canaliculus, through the common canaliculus, all the way to your NND. Endonasally, you check the position of the balloon. Then you inflate the balloon. So it inflates at the point of your partial NND. You deflate, you have to reinflate twice. And um, essentially, that is what is done in this balloon catheter dilation. Mucosine. Now, what's the concept of a mucosine? You have a blockage at the common canaliculus and at the NLD. So, your sac is where the fluid gets collected. It distends, the patient presence with that distension at the lacrimal sac area. Now, in these cases, no, your NLD, if it is partial, that is when, when you press on the sac, it drains out. That's when you apply pressure, the partial NLD opens up and the fluid drains out. In a mucosine, uh, your management is going to be a DCR. You release the common canalicular block, MMC intubation. Okay, You decide with without MMC. But intubation, yes, because you have a common canalicular block. Failed DCR, you repeat your DCR external or endonasal, but in failed, intubation MMC is what to, is to be kept in mind. Now the role of MMC. There are various papers which give varying dosage of MMC, the duration for which it should be kept, how it is applied. There are various different methods. On an average, essentially MMC, it does improve your success rate. 0. 0.5 milligrams per ml is what is adequate. Uh, many people dip, put it, put, dip, uh, dip a cotton bud in the MMC and then apply it over your uh, 
So commonly, if there's a common canalicular block, you have snipped it over there, you can apply. People also inject in the very uh, common canalicular area around it. With your 26 number or a thinner needle, you inject it into the substance. Okay, and if it's a repeat, if you are seeing too much of fibrosis in your uh, flap area, then over there also you can inject. Okay. Endonasal DCR, if you're planning an endonasal DCR, <clears throat> pre-op CT scan is important to see the bony anatomy. This is a DCG. Okay, you are seeing the dye in the sac uh, on the right side. So this is a CT scan, so the right side will be your left. So that is where uh, you seeing the dye is not coming all the way down, there's obstruction, whereas the left, you can see the dye coming down freely. This is a video of a endonasal uh, DCR. In this, I do not have a video of an external, I'm sorry. We just quickly go through a few important steps just to know uh, what it is like. So, um, see, this is the, um, okay, so this is the incision that we are taking over the sac area, okay? That is the nasal mucosal incision, okay? I'll go a little ahead. Okay, we are just extending the incision. Oh, wait, sure. Yeah, so over here, um, on the right side, what you're seeing is the bone. We have elevated the nasal flap, mucosal flap, and you are seeing the bone. Okay, you see the yellow, uh, I do, you can see my cursor, right? This is the bone, okay? And this is the nasal flap we have elevated after the incision. And we are starting the bony bunch. See, this was the first bony bunch, okay? Can see a few more punches to just get an idea. So I hope you've got the orientation. This is medial, this is lateral, this is where your sac is. See, this is the next punch. Okay. So this is where the punch is happening. This is your bone that we have exposed. I just go ahead a little. This is we are just extending the punch further. Okay, you can see the sac over here. Okay, this is your lacrimal sac through the punch, beyond the punch. Okay. There, you can again see the lacrimal sac. Mm -hmm. This is our uh, margin of the bony punch. Okay, we are punching further. After that, you lift up your, see we are making the sac flap now. We are taking the incision over the lacrimal sac over here. Okay. And uh, the ways of closing, endonasally closing the flap really varies from surgeon to surgeon. There are many options. Some people just keep the flaps opposite and they say the blood which is going to clot and it uh, it does keep the sacs in position uh, uh what i like to do is we use these clips liga clips so here we are just fashioning the flap uh, see this clip which is going in and then you just press it these are called liga clips essentially when you press it you take go it go in with the faucet and when you press it it keeps the two flaps approximately so these, these clips work very well. Uh, I like the usage of these clips, essentially, for Indonesia. Okay, so I think that's what we have. This is post-operatively. Sure. So you can see the clip. There's a little bit of a pause because it's, it's a first day post-op. First, you know, first week post-op. Okay, but it does... Uh, and the procedures which we have not covered, conjunctival DCR, Jones tube placement. Essentially, I'm not a very big fan of this procedure. Um, indication for this procedure will be uh, uh, 
severe canaliculo block where you can't bypass the canalicular system and the patient wants something to be done. So essentially, you're going from the conjunctiva straight, you are approaching the uh, sac. Okay. The thing with this procedure is um, there's a lot of air reflux coming into your eye. You're making a direct opening, right? So it is not a very comfortable uh, thing for a patient. Uh, but this is what this is an option which is there, of course. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. It was wonderful. Uh, I have couple of questions yeah, sure. uh, one is uh, after if external dcr we have done mm -hmm. and uh, if there is a failure there is mm -hmm. again regurgitation yes. then in that case uh, is it preferable to do an endonasal letter or it's better to again revise the external dcr yeah. um, so if the first surgery has been external then personally i would prefer to go external once again um, you have the the tissue dissection is done your uh, view the exposure through external is much better uh, it you can enlarge the bony osseum significantly and uh, it is easier but if your first has been endonasal then for sure i would go endonasal i will not uh, give the patient this. the revision for a in previous endonasal through endonasal is easy so essentially, that is how I follow uh, practically. Okay. Uh, and one more uh, question, like in case of uh, uh, pediatric, the, of course, I think you covered mainly the adult uh, yeah. lacrimal drainage system problem, but we often see like uh, all students uh, will see the congenital LDO more commonly. Uh, so what is the general protocol uh, which you follow yes. for uh, probing okay. and later if any definitive procedure is required? Yes. So um, until one year of age, we uh, do not probe a child of congenital nasolacrimal duct. We, dis we ask them for the sac massage. It is very important to teach the parents how to do the massage. Uh, you tell them massage, thoda dikhaya, they'll just keep on rubbing in that area, which does not solve the purpose. You do it for the child in front of the parent pressure over the fundus of the sac and then move downwards. So usually for, for the ease of the parent to remember, you say 10 strokes three times a day, four times a day. Okay. Uh, it's usually af it's after the age of one year that we plan probing. The reason being that a lot of congenital uh, nasolacrimal duct obstructions do open up result by the age of one year. Uh, probing is planned one year or more. If a patient comes to you at a little elder age, suppose the child comes at two years, three years, but has never, uh, with a history of congenital, watering since birth, but has never undergone any procedure, I will first do probing. Okay, the concept is that in a congenital uh, nasolacrimal duct obstruction, there's a membrane at the opening of the nasolacrimal duct. Okay. And that membrane is what is causing the obstruction. And that membrane is what you overcome when you do probing. So if it is the membrane which is causing the obstruction, even if the child is two years, three years, you can still overcome the membrane. So uh, for congenital, if the child has not undergone a procedure before, I will always, as the child grows, what happens is the success, uh, elderly children, the success of uh, probing then comes down a little. So then you counsel that we will first do probing. If it does not resolve, then we can plan in the same sitting, just convert to a DCR or uh, maybe a different sitting, however the parents are comfortable. But um, yes. And uh, so the outcomes of first probing, if done well, uh, are very good. Repeated probing, if your first probing, if I have done the first probing myself, and I know that it was adequately done, then I know that the outcomes of repeated probing are, it's not going to be much, uh, it's not going to be much better and I will plan a DCR. But if the first probing I have not done, 
then I would say that I will try to probe once, see if I can open. If it doesn't, then plan a DCR. Uh, for DCR in pediatric, what is the age? Uh, whether the child, like two years old child, we can do a DCR we if can. after the failed we can probing, see. or we should. Be. Okay, so, so two do. years and above. Yes. We can do. Okay. And uh, what is the role of uh, intubation DCR in case of uh, children? Children, we will prefer to intubate. Uh, essentially, uh, in children, there are a few things. As the child grows, as the bony structure grows, our ostium is, uh, there is, there are chances of it not being adequate. So uh, as the child grows, there is, there might be a need of repeated but the other thing is that the healing process in children is much uh, better, is stronger than uh, adults. So the chances of the ostium closing down is higher in pediatric age group than in adults. So in pediatric, I will always intubate. In adults, I will not always intubate unless and until uh, required. But in pediatrics, I will uh, in pediatric patient, I will always intubate. And uh, when is the tube removed generally? Uh, generally six weeks okay and that is done under again uh, anesthesia or we can no. do it under so, local? Uh, the tube is removed between six weeks to three months uh, in adults you can just snip the tube at the conjunctival level between your puncta and you ask them to sneeze and it comes out through the nose your knots are in the nose uh, in pediatric it's it makes sense to give a short ga and just under a quick short cheer. If okay. it's a very small child, but if you think the child will cooperate, you can try. In okay. open and the procedure will be same, like cutting yes. from the conjunctal side and then yes. pulling. Sweeping from the nose, yes. Okay. Uh, Sergeant, I think put uh, black threads inside when they are doing incubation for uh, seeing it better. Is that commonly not, used? Not required, sir. Not required. Okay. Not required. You can see. You can see it, yeah. Uh, in adult, uh, one more question, like uh, what are the indications for doing DCG in cases? So, uh, DCT indications we did uh, cover. Uh, sorry, DCG. Uh, the... DCG, I usually plan uh, one, uh, okay, I was just going to, D okay, never mind. DCG, uh, one, if we are doing endonasal, uh, in it, I used to do for every patient, but now I don't do it. Actually, endonasal only a CT scan is also adequate pre op. The most important indication of a DCG would be in a suspected uh, sac tumor. So, if you want to delineate, you do, you do it with a DCG to know the lumen of the sac, the status of the lumen. So, that is. So, also in <laughs> post-traumatic uh, cases, uh, do you prefer? Uh, post-traumatic is a different ball game altogether. Yes, okay. post-traumatic. Uh, if the one is, you have to see the site of fracture. Right. Site will uh, in uh, relation to the sac. That will give you an idea. Second. You can do a DCG in traumatic to give you an idea of the integrity of the uh, sac. But it really depends on how severe the fracture is and what you are planning. If you are planning a DCT or you are planning otherwise. So, but yes, that can be an indication for DCG. Uh, for like uh, common canalicular blocks, of course, uh, as you mentioned, and that is the experience that the many procedures fail uh, in common canalicular blocks. Uh, in patients who are still complaining of a lot of EP4 because some patients, you know, they are annoyed with the watering and uh, surgically we can't do. Is there any other option like Botox or anything which can, or any other surgical option to reduce the EP4? Um, sir, it has been uh, documented that uh, Botox to the lecanal gland now, I'm not a very big fan of this because essentially you are inducing dry eye in some form. You are reducing the production of the tears. So, uh, yes, if 
you actually first see your Shermer's test, you see what is your tear production. Botox to lacrimal gland has been done. It is doable. It is an easy procedure. The procedure is not. But, but you keep in mind that essentially you are in a form inducing dry eye for the patient. It is short term. Of course, it's not a permanent thing. So it is. But uh, I am very apprehensive personally about uh, doing Botox to the gland. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions from students? That's about it. Uh, so uh, I think one of the important slides from uh, general ophthalmologist point of view was uh, deciding whether to go ahead with cataract surgery or not. I think you clearly mentioned the indications. One more question is uh, that after, suppose there was an NLD block, uh, like chronic dactyocystitis, mm -hmm. and uh, now you have operated uh, doing DCR. When should we take up the patient for cataract surgery? Month before six weeks. Uh, for sure, if you have done an external DCR, if okay. you have done an endonasal, you can take it earlier, but preferably I say not before four weeks. Okay. And uh, one more question was, if the patient has chronic dacryocystitis, but now patient presented with acute on chronic dacryocystitis, then when the DCR procedure, we should wait for the infection to resolve and so, uh, yeah. yeah we will first give antibiotics if we are planning on external uh, do not plan your surgery before six weeks once again not before six weeks of the episode of acute dacryocystitis there are patients who will keep coming with repeated episodes and you don't even get the six week time in between two episodes but still if you are planning external don't do before six weeks because your surgical outcomes will not, uh, your tissue inside is very friable. So uh, it will bleed also and the tissue being friable, your flaps will not uh, be as good. And when you suture the flaps, it will not hold it as well. So uh, external DCR, not before six weeks of an episode of acute tattoos. Uh, Indonesia can be done earlier. Indonesia can be done earlier. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much, madam, for this opportunity for our students and us. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarah. Thank you. Good day.